So we're now moving on to our first of two panel sessions. And for this, uh, I need to introduce somebody who really doesn't need any introduction at all for, for this event. So first of all, uh, Professor Tobias Troger, who is Professor of Private Law, Commercial and Business Law and Jurisprudence at the House of Finance at Goethe University in Frankfurt. And he's also a research member of the ECGI. Among many, many other things, he advises the European Parliament on banking supervision. So the project he's going to be presenting to us on uh, relates to venture capital and European corporate laws. And as you know, its title is Venture Capital and European Corporate Law, Bargaining in the Shadow of Regulatory Constraints. We'll have about 20 minutes or so from Tobias on, on that. And that will be followed uh, for about 10 minutes or so um, of observation by Frank Vogel. And we're really delighted to be welcoming Frank with us today. He's a private practice lawyer with decades of experience uh, advising companies and venture capital investors. He's a partner in and a co-founder of um, a law firm in Berlin that uh, bears his name. And I should say to everybody, he was named Lawyer of the Year in 2021 for private equity in Berlin and Lawyer of the Year for venture capital in 2022. So Frank, fantastic to have you with us. Um, Tobias, can I head over to you. I'm really looking forward to your, your paper. Sure. Thanks. Thanks, Deep, uh, for this very warm welcome. And thanks, everybody, for joining. Um, and I'm truly happy that I can uh, misrepres misrepresent our paper today. I don't have to necessarily thank the organizers for including it, but uh, here it's great to also have the support of my co-authors, Luca Enriquez and Casimir Niger, who are in this call. And um, let me just jump in immediately. What we do is uh, we want to address the research question whether European laws, which we equal, and I will get to that why we do that, uh, largely with the Italian and German corporate law, may prevent uh, an effective US style VC contracting uh, in the relevant jurisdictions. Um, so the, the, what, we, what we end up doing is essentially writing a quite loyally paper, which at least uh, Luca and I thought we would never do again. But uh, here, you know, engaging with all the corporate law doctrine, et cetera, has an instrumental purpose because we want to essentially answer or contribute to answering a question um, that has been haunting scholars in our field quite a bit, which is the interrelation of the development of VC markets and the institutions of corporate law and governance and how this plays uh, together. And uh, what we present and what we uh, think we do as an innovative, as, a, as an innovation, pushing the knowledge frontier a little bit, is we offer a granular view on corporate law uh, and contracting. So the interrelation between uh, corporate law as the background for VC contracts in the relevant jurisdictions. And um, I will also off, try to offer a preliminary assessment what to do with that, because in a sense, uh, that is a, a legal data mining exercise so far. Uh, we're looking at what we see, um, and we don't necessarily have a strong view yet on what to do with it. Um, so let me just jump in and uh, relate a little bit our research to prior contributions to literature. Uh, the classical line finance literature has generally in, uh, inquired whether the quality of corporate law um, has an impact on the development of VC markets. And there are mixed findings. Some say, well, not really. If you're using, for example, the classical gang of four uh, indices, so particularly the LSV anti-director rights index, you don't find much of a correlation, but at least you can somehow extrapolate from the findings of the paper of Jang and Wells um, that you know corporate law might simply influence the availability of IPO markets and therefore has an impact on uh, the earlier stages of uh, funding of, of uh, newly established firms. Uh, Franklin Allen and his co-author are using a different metric for uh, proxying the quality of corporate law, and they find that it's not so much investor protection in terms of equity investor protection, but really credit protection, which matters the most, which makes sense as the structure of many uh, VC investments takes the form, at least the legal form, um, of uh, debt investments. And then uh, our keynote speaker joined uh, with Josh Lerner, have also uh, contributed to the debate with other papers that simply come up with the notion that the common law, for various reasons, might be better suited to support the development of a VC market. Um, and other papers that have looked deeper into uh, the, the mechanics that are at play here 
uh, and essentially come up with the idea that superior enforcement creates preconditions for portfolio diversification um, and therefore uh, somewhat uh, contributes to the development. So the, the, the general takeaway from this is that COP law quality seems to matter somewhat, but it's not really that you can make uh, a very strong claim with regard to the causal relationships between uh, that, that are here. And then, which is a paper that is closer to, to what we do, Steve Kaplan, has joined with other co-authors looked at uh, the contracting stage and essentially said, okay, look, how does the contracting influence all of these market developments? And he says, well, you know, uh, the contracting matters, of course, but corporate law is not really an impediment because essentially um, investors or VC, VC firms and, um, and, 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 and <clears throat> entrepreneurs can essentially do whatever they want despite the fact that they're acting in a different legal environment because uh, private ordering allows them to simply mimic the U.S. style VC contract, and therefore they get whatever they want, regardless of the legal regime. Um, so in a sense, it's a cozy and bargain. So wherever you start, uh, private parties can reallocate the relevant property rights in a way that they find fit, and therefore uh, corporate law does not really stipulate any impediments that prevent them from doing what is efficient in their case. Now, um, we want to, as I already highlighted, contribute to the debate by just going away from the classical law and finance view and just looking at the general corporate law quality, but really looking at how corporate law could matter with regards to the background against, uh, or you know, corporate law serving as the background against which we see and entrepreneurs structure their investment and governance, and therefore um, what they actually can achieve through private ordering. And the intuition obviously is that the relative flexibility and rigidity of the corporate law regime affects the contract design, so what you can actually do and what you can't do, uh, and that should have potential efficiency implications by simply impl uh, impacting on transaction costs, um, the, the most extreme, um, uh, with the most extreme version that uh, that the transaction costs go to the infinity and therefore uh, some solutions are simply not available. Uh, the theoretical background, so uh, default terms of corporate co of, the corp of corporate law are s essentially defining the corporate contracts. So, so this idea of the nexus of contracts, and they are basically pre-shaped by the default terms. And you have to contract around this default arrangement um, and particularly in the field of venture capital, the relevant agents have very strong incentives to uh, shape shift the firm, uh, meaning to really reallocate the cash flow and the governance rights in order to reflect the specificities of uh, the venture capital ecosystem. Um, and therefore they engage in this relatively complex private order exercise uh, that seems to, uh, you know, put in place a structure that aligns the organizational and the extension logic of the portfolio firms with uh, the typical objectives of the VC fund who wants to exit at a certain point uh, and then cash in. Um, and it also, you know, this contracting exercise paves the way to optimal portfolio diversification. So many of the determinants that were present in the law and finance literature prior um, are also prevalent, pre present here in our analysis as the background that they want to achieve. Um, now, what, what this does um, is essentially they allocate these uh, cash flow and control rights on a contingent basis. So whatever happens during the term of the investment, the control rights and the cash flow rights might actually change in the sense that payouts and also intervention uh, possibilities uh, are augmented if things turn south. Um, and this happens through separate channels, so separate contracting devices, and it relies mainly on self-enforcing provisions. So, um, <clears throat> so it is really more or less about uh, in, a, in, a, in, a, in a contingency, in a state where the investment, where the portfolio firm does not perform so well, uh, then VC firms can take over and also receive some benefits that limit their downside exposure. Um, 
Now, as I already said, this causes all this all causes transaction costs in the most extreme scenario. Transaction costs are so high that certain uh, efficient solutions are simply not available. Or, uh, you know, at least the, the costs of achieving the solutions that you want to have um, are significantly more costly, either both ex post or ex ante. So the contracting exercise uh, is maybe more convoluted, or uh, alternatively, there's much more uncertainty about uh, how things will actually play out at the end. And at the margin, uh, corporate law with its rigidity or flexibility. Uh, may simply determine these transaction costs and therefore a rigid system may prevent certain deals from happening and uh, we see investments in the first place. What we can't do or what we don't do in this paper is we, we cannot quantify the negative cost uh, effect that we're describing here. Uh, so it may well be that this just doesn't matter at all. So uh, the, the Kaplan hypothesis uh, may, may well be, uh, but we're not making a claim as to the effect. We're just claiming this is a marginal effect and it should matter. And just you know, a word of caution, a footnote, um, we see now or we observe now a turn in the market. So uh, we have just exited the boom phase. And therefore, people are looking much, much closer uh, at their investments. And therefore, the relative suitability of the contract framework that people are using might start to matter more, right? And therefore, uh, everybody has now said, well, we don't worry so much about uh, contractual arrangements. This may actually be just the recipe for a very hard lending. Um, so there is no contradiction to the observed booms in uh, EU uh, venture capital markets over the recent years. So it may be more a story about the downside and minimizing the risks. And then once again, just you know, uh, echoing some of the early discussions that we had. If this is all, you know, if the only thing that venture capitalists care about is really fighting the dragons, the unicorns, or whatever mythical creatures they're looking for, um, then this doesn't matter. But you know, if there is something to limiting the downside of your exposure, then this might be really something that matters. Now, just let us quickly look at examples. Um, Delaware corporate law, which is the default corporate law in the US that is used for the contracting, um, has some properties that are well known. It's relatively flexible and therefore allows for exact, exactly the state contingent cash flow and governance rights allocation through private ordering that I described as one of the essential ingredients. And uh, also the, U the United States benefits from the uh, efforts of the National Venture Capital Association which has made sure through several uh, efforts that contracts are largely standardized and are also presumably enforceable uh, across the relevant jurisdictions. Um, and then, you know, contestable to a certain degree, but you have some accurate judicial enforcement in the US through very experienced courts that are able to police opportunism. And now just to, to give you a, a glance at what contracting wants to achieve so regarding the financial structure, the typical uh, vehicle that is implied here is convertible preferred shares, which allow for a conversion of the debt securities into equity. Um, they carry also liquidation preferences and uh, special dividends, dividends accrue. Um, and therefore, they pr provide exactly this downside protection that I have been talking about, because uh, you know, if you don't convert, you have a preferred uh, fixed claim that does not only give you a claim to the amount invest, uh, invested, but also some interest that accrue over time, regardless of the more or less regardless of the performance of the of the firm, and therefore uh, limit your downside exposure if things go wrong. And you know you also participate in the full upside because you simply can't convert. Second aspect with regard to the governance model, which is important, are corporate opportunity doctrines waivers. So the corporate opportunity doctrine essentially limits the, path, the, the ability of any uh, person uh, engaged in the firm of exploiting opportun business opportunities that come across them in their capacity as members, um, either of the board of directors or as shareholders, and therefore provide obviously an impediment for the typical VC firm, uh, for the venture capitalists who 
by definition come across several business obligations. So waiving this makes life just much easier. I'm not saying that it, uh, you know if you don't if you cannot waive uh, the corporate opportunities doctrine, um, you cannot do venture capital contracting, but it se severely limits your possibility to do so. And then the, the third point regarding the divestment process, which is also something that is important for we see firms who want to exit at some point are the so-called tag along rights. So it is essentially the right to join a sale of control through the entrepreneur who sells control at the same terms. And the rationale behind that is for those people familiar with the discussion uh, about the mandatory bid is read that if you have someone who is, you know, you put your trust in and you base your investment decision on is just leaving the firm, you can exit at the same terms um, as the control holder. And therefore, uh, this solution is quite important, but it hinges critically in its function on the venture capitalist receiving uh, uh, really the same price and that this right has to be equal, uh, and that this uh, also is enforceable. Now, uh, what you can do, uh, our, our findings essentially, <clears throat> and I just want to uh, quickly highlight a couple of points. Um, so our idea here is this U.S. model uh, conforms more or less to an efficient uh, way of setting up the venture capital a, a entrepreneurial relationship because it has been stable over time and across economic and credit cycles. And therefore, you can assume that this is really something that is by and large efficient. Um, and therefore, there is a strong incentive to mimic this model in Europe uh, by simply saying, okay, look, uh, this uh, is exactly what we should achieve because that comes close to uh, financial contracting theory, what, what, it, what it would predict uh, that, that's happening. Um, and now, do EU corporate laws that we're looking at prevent this kind of piggybacking, which could be efficient? Um, and despite the trend in Europe to uh, foster VC investments and really uh, engage in uh, reform activities that uh, support innovation, et cetera, um, local corporate laws prove relatively sticky in this regard. It is quite important that at least we observe, and from the discussions with practitioners, but maybe Frank uh, is going to tell us a little bit different story, um, local corporate law, so really the national corporate law is the only one that is available simply because you cannot easily contract out of that despite the so-called choice of law doctrine under the centrist rulings um, of the European Court of Justice. It's just something that's not really happening. And we focus on German and Italian corporate law simply because because we think they are representative at least for the typical continental European jurisdictions in corporate law. And we also look at uh, the law in action, so not really what is only on the books, but really the, what, how the doctrine, which is important in continental Europe, and courts are actually shaping uh, the, the law uh, as it is applied. And what we find just very quickly is that essentially more or less uh, the typical governance, financial structure, and divestment processes that we see uh, established in private ordering in the U.S. are not available in Europe, um, more or less, at least in the, in the jurisdictions that we look at. So conversion rights don't really work because there are several doctrines, both in Germany and Italy, that clash with that. Liquidation preferences that are, regardless of actual profits accruing at the firm, are also very, very difficult to establish. Um, and therefore, uh, it is something that, that, you know, convertible preferred shares are hard to mimic in the European context. Corporate opportunity doctrine waivers are also not really available because uh, the duty of loyalty is mandatory component of the relevant corporate laws, and therefore you cannot easily waive it. Functional equivalents are also hard uh, to establish because, you know, there are say, circumvention doctrines that uh, would, would not allow them. And then tag-along rights, um, it's quite interesting to see that the provisions from the U.S. contracts are typically prevailing in European contractual frameworks as well. They move to uh, shareholder agreements, but they are there. But we conjecture that uh, they will be hard to enforce. And uh, this is obviously something that particularly my co-authors can speak more knowledgeably about. Italian doctrine offers 
some some impediments that are I think typical because it is really the question of fairness that comes along, and therefore uh, the the question of can you really describe uh, or can you really say that the price is equal and will be exactly the same um, is hard to achieve with legal certainty. Now. There is therefore somewhat the myth of functional equivalence, as we call it, uh, because what we see, and um, unfortunately, so uh, our academic discussion succumbed to COVID, uh, so he preferred staying sick instead of discussing our paper, because we require our uh, you know commentators to wade through this uh, doctrinal analysis that we provide, um, and therefore we're extremely thankful that Frank is holding up. Um, and the idea here is now um, that you know in the details that we describe. We find that sometimes functional equivalence works, many times it doesn't, and sometimes it's only formal. And what we mean by this is essentially we mean that um, you can write these things into your contracts, but you cannot be sure that you can uh, uh, really enforce them. And here, the Italian case study that we present is really about drag along provisions. So the possibility of the venture capitalist to uh, force the entrepreneurs to sell out as well uh, in a trade sale. And that was accepted in Italy for 25 years, but then all of a sudden courts following uh, an influential academic, obviously, uh, just struck this provision down saying, okay, this doesn't work because it's not really, uh, it's not, not conforming with the fair value protection that we have in our law. And of course, there you see just, this is a spotlight on the problems that you incur because obviously this has systemic consequences for contracting if all of a sudden the courts tell you, oh, this doesn't work anymore. And uh, Italian lawyers in the field have said this is really it has a dramatic impact on investors because uh, you know our our corporate law environment is essentially a minefield for VC contracting lawyers. And therefore, that's a, that has cer certainly a problem. So, just wrapping up quickly, um, we find that you cannot easily replicate U.S. style VC contracting in Europe. Um, corporate law, therefore, has direct impact on VC contracting and affects contract design and functionality. And therefore, we conjecture that the VC contracts that we see, although they look at the at the at first glance very similar to the U.S. ones, carry less value than their U.S. counterparts. And the reason why uh, they, you know, work reasonably well and why it is understandable that people are clinging to the U.S. contracting model is because they also serve to a certain degree an expressive function of law, because they simply define social norms and essentially define what the VC community is expecting from its participants and how they should behave. But obviously, we also say that this is the second best uh, solution only because once things become contested uh, in unsuccessful ventures, this uh, you know expectation of social norm be, uh, following behavior may simply break down. Uh, with regard to the policy implications, I'm sure we cannot say much because we cannot quantify the effect, and therefore uh, we don't dare to say that there is something that uh, needs to be done uh, definitely, but uh, we might come up with more uh, at a later stage. Thank you very much. <laughs> Great, thanks, Teresa. That's absolutely fascinating. Um, and I'm really struck listening to you. you know, there's this huge, intricate, endless process of capital markets union with ever more hardwiring into how you regulate a fund. And I think you've shown so clearly the bigger story here. So that's uh, absolutely super. Um, Frank, um, can I bring you in for about 10 minutes or so for your observations uh, on the paper? Thanks so much. Sure. Thank you, Tobias and everyone, and good afternoon. Um, when I'm, I'm listening to this, I, I started wondering if I'm a bit like a bumblebee of which physicists for quite some time have said it couldn't fly because the wings are much too small to ever lift the body volume and weight. And the only reason why a bumblebee flies would be that it's completely ignorant and has no concern for physics. Um, from, a, from a practitioner's view, working in the venture capital um, area for about 25 years in Germany now, um, you, you won't be surprised that I take a slightly different view on the compatibility of, of German law and U.S.-style venture capital arrangements. 
Um, I mean, we, we see a number of large and reputable U.S. investors um, like Excel, Bessemer, Co2, Index, Sequoia, Tiger Global quite regularly investing in Germany, and all of them accepting that um, I think what in, in the paper was called the stickiness of corporate law, um, i.e. That, that the terms when investing into, into uh, German target companies would be subject to German law and German corporate law. Um, obviously, I, I can't tell either how much more U.S. venture capital we would be attracting if, if our corporate law was less rigid. Um, but given what we have seen in terms of flexibility on even standard economic VC terms in the last five years, which, which really have been the most founder-friendly um, five years that I've ever worked in, um, I, I tend to believe that um, a potential higher litigation and enforcement risk is something that most of the venture funds would rather accept than let a, a promising oppor um, investment opportunity slip. Now, obviously, in, in assessing a, a, a litigation and enforcement risk, you certainly have to have to look at the, the merits of the dispute um, at issue, but you also have to take into account, I believe, the probability of any of the parties involved actually going to court in the, in the first place. And w when I started um, working in this area um, at the end of last millennium, to give you an idea of how old I am, actually, um, um, there, there was very little court precedence on VC arrangements in Germany. Um, but to be quite honest, almost 25 years since, um, the situation hasn't changed much. And, um, and we've seen um, at least two major downturns of the venture capital market, one um, parallel to the decline of the Neuer Mark, which was an, an um, an um, exchange um, downturn and exchange segment um, on the German public market, um, particularly for startups, um, in 2002, 2003, and then obviously in the aftermath of the of the um, Lehman crisis. Um, and in in our perception, it hasn't at all um, influenced the frequency of litigation and and um, enforcement issues. So, so it, it seems to me that the preparedness to, to actually fight provisions that someone has agreed to at some stage um, is rather independent whether it is a booming market or a busting market. Um, as a VC investor, obviously, you don't want to be known, whether in a good market or in a bad market, you don't want to be known as suing the founders. Um, simply because um, you may not be invited to um, the next promising investment opportunity in an industry that shares information to the max. And um, I believe at, as, a, as a founder, you, you may shy away from the potential cost burden of fighting a legal position that you've actually agreed to at some stage in a shareholders agreement or an investment agreement um, on the basis of rather vague corporate law principles or a notion of unfairness. And, and when you look at the unfairness issue, um, I think this is, um, this is possibly based on a misconception of um, what venture capital valuations actually do. Um, because it is based on the on the assumption that in the valuations applied in VC transactions reflect the fair market value of the target company and correspondingly of the shareholding of the founders, um, um, and that it may be unfair if the founder doesn't get its pro rata portion of such valuations. Um, but it is actually. It is actually true that the VC valuations, and most of the times, is far away from the fair market valuation in terms of what the founder could convert his shareholding into money at um, in case of an instant sale at the time when the VC valuation is being applied. 
um, typically, um, VC valuations of a startup um, are based on an investor internal appraisal of visions of growth and development um, of the target company's business and on a very subjective degree of confidence in the capabilities of the founders to actually realize such vision. Um, if you look at, for example, at dilution protection and today's standard 1x non-participating proceeds preferences from this point of view, I think you may well come to the conclusion that those provisions aren't so unfair and are possibly actually perfectly fair. If, if you sell a company in an M&A transaction with a large earnout portion, I think no one um, would consider it unfair that the earnout portion is not being paid if the earnout criteria don't materialize. And the same would apply in case you reverse the mechanics. You simply say you pay the, the entire purchase price right away, but you, after two years or three years, you have a claim for repayment um, in case um, the earnout uh, criteria do not materialize. So I, I think I would like to wonder why it should be an issue if you agree to invest at a certain pre-money valuation but agree to adjust the valuation in case the vision on which the valuation is based doesn't materialize at least to the extent that the company will be in a position to raise further funds or exit at a valuation at least equal to the previous round's post-money valuation. And I would tend to adopt the same argument in the context of lever provisions. If all parties in a VC scenario know and accept from the start that a VC investor's decision to invest at a certain valuation is to a large extent based on the joint understanding that the founders would fully engage to support the underlying vision and the company for a period of three, four, five years, that's the typical vesting terms, I would argue that lever provisions eventually work to adjust the valuation to the exclusive burden of the one shareholder or founder who plays out of tune. So um, I have a similar, but that's, uh, I understand the, the, the showcase was an Italian one. I have a, I have a similar response to the, to the tag-along issue. In, in, in German companies, at least in the, in the most frequently used um, legal form of a company with limited liability, um, it is perfectly fine to make any share transfer subject to a consent requirement of the shareholders. Um, and um, what, what we do in, in German contracts is we simply say um, this consent needs to be granted if right of first refusal and tag-along provisions are being complied with, and it needs to be denied um, in case it isn't. So um, I, I don't think... Um, you would ever come to a situation where the founder sells his shareholding or her shareholding, um, and then the venture capitalist has to sue that the purchaser um, acquires his shares too. You would simply say if, if the venture capitalist shareholding is not included in the sale, then the sale won't happen in the first place. Um, and, and I admit that there is... Um, there is in the scholarship um, there are there are views that um, under certain circumstances um, the consent may need to be granted but but again um, if you if you structure the mechanics as I described it um, it would simply be the founder's burden to actually litigate and prove that um, there are certain circumstances which are so unfair if he is not in a position to sell his shareholding. And I think he, he'll have a, have a difficult case on that one. So to, 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 to wrap it up from my point of view, um, I, I don't believe that German corporate law is much of an impediment to um, attracting U.S. venture capital, um, nor do I see it to require to, to substantially um, turn away from adopting U.S.-style sets of rights and obligations in VC transactions. It does require to slightly 
structure them differently. Um, but only because conversion rights, um, U.S. style, may not work. Um, it doesn't mean that you couldn't um, you couldn't apply liquidation preferences or proceeds preferences um, to the same extent in a in a German shareholders agreement. Um, this obviously all requires a proper understanding of VC economics, and you may take um, the view that. Um, it is not safe to trust that German courts would um, would be the ones who are um, most likely to fully understand VC economics. So, if if you had asked me two and a half years ago whether I would trust that they do, um, I, I believe I'd, I'd be I'd be doubtful. <clears throat> Um, but please note that what I initially said on the um, unfairness issue regarding um, VC valuations um, is not my own reflection or perception, and I haven't invented that. I have simply quoted, obviously um, in a translation, um, a statement of a recent statement of the um, High Regional Court in Munich, the Oberlandesgericht München. Um, that had to decide on whether a VC valuation is a proper basis for calculating notaries' fees, for which um, for which you need the, the you needed the the fair market value of the shares that were at issue, and um, and it it quite clearly stated um, what I stated about VC venture um, VC valuations and said that this is not a fair market value as a proper basis for calculating notarized fees. So I'm all optimistic today. Thank you for listening. Frank, thank you. It's fascinating to have that that insight from 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 practice. Really, Th thanks so much for that. And to be before we circle back to you, um, I'm just going to because there's a there's a really good chat going on. If colleagues haven't seen it, so there's an interesting discussion here about where these these VC firms are actually incorporating. So you can see that there. Um, but um, Ava, can I bring you in? I think you have a question. Yes, uh, yes. Thank you very much. So wonderful, wonderful project and and great presentations. Um, I'm wondering. I'm sort of queer. Um, questioning your assumption that it's ever going to be possible to assume that any model of contracting is efficient irrespective of the jurisdiction. Because I, I say this thinking that presumably venture capital contracts have been developed hands in gloves with American law. So they have been fine-tuned to the local legal environment um, to suit the interests of investors and that, that they have been developed in that way for some time. It's then no surprise that if you move them to a different system, they won't quite work as well because they now are in a new environment. And then if you then think about the perspective of the American investors, um, very much like Frank said, I wouldn't advise them to bring those contracts and hope, to and hope that they will function in the same way. In fact, they need to be strongly advised to adapt their contracts. Um, so then those contracts stop being efficient because they need to adapt to a new environment. And local investors then definitely shouldn't be using those contracts because they would misunderstand them, lacking the US law background. Um, and and so, so, so I'm wondering if, if the idea of, of this sort of efficient contracting model because it has worked very well for a long time in the US, if that assumption need to, needs to be revised. Great, thanks, Ava. Um, Tobias, do you want to come in now? Sure. Um, yeah, thanks, thanks again for uh, these wonderful comments, Frank, and also Ifa. Uh, so, so just uh, a very quick reaction to Frank. I think uh, this is all super helpful. I, I've taken tons of notes, um, so I don't want to go into the details. Um, so I think that um, I agree with most of what you said. I think that we're just describing an incremental difference. And uh, where I would just push back a little is on the idea that litigation is really not you know, on the horizon. And what we see is, of course, it doesn't come from VCs. It doesn't come from the VC uh, firms. It comes from sort of disgruntled founders, if you will. And that's exactly uh, what we see also in the US. So the Trados case, so I don't wanna uh, you know, uh, 
sort of preempt the next paper. But the Tratos case in the US is exactly that. So, so you have uh, a perfectly rational, economically valid decision to ex execute a trade sale, but then people are sort of exposed thinking they're losing, uh, and then they litigate. So this is, I think, the scenario that, that we have in mind. And with regard to IFA, um, so just quickly, uh, our idea is not that they should, uh, we're not looking at the contract uh, as it is written in the US, we're looking at function. So we're looking at so th the shape shifting idea. So this is a provision that allocates the cash flow rights according to the rationality of the VC investment contract. Uh, and the contract here is not a legal contract, it is really this idea uh, of an investment relationship being framed in a way uh, so that it is efficient. And I think this is something that is universal. We can talk about the idea of efficiency and, and how universal it is. And then, of course, we look at, can this function be implemented through uh, a contract in a different jurisdiction? And that the contract on its face has to look different. That is, you know, fully understood and appreciated. And also, Frank has hinted at this. It can migrate. So, so some things that you do in the U.S. in the corporate charter goes into shareholder agreements. So that's so for in the first place. It's okay, but that of course has enforcement difference. It changes the enforcement uh, 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 dynamics, and therefore. Uh, we're fully aware of, uh, you know, the, the problem of transplanting certain uh, arrangements. But on the other hand, uh, I think we're, we're looking more or less at functions. And there's a lot of criticism for this approach. But I think that's uh, we're at least aware that it's not about transforming the, the contracts on, on their face. Um, so I don't know if Casimiro or Luca has something to add to this. Correct my wrongs. Alex, please, if you want to come in. Or not? Not really. On my side, I think. Okay. He has really said, uh, I subscribe to whatever he said. I will only add perhaps to uh, what Frank was saying before about uh, the idea that uh, uh, corporate law is not uh, an obstacle. We are fully aware, of course, that corporate law might not be an obstacle in general. But we are just talking about its marginal impact on uh, deal making, which of course we also say we cannot quantify, but at the same time we uh, have some theoretical reason to argue that it might be there. So that's of course uh, a question which can be addressed only by means of empirical research. And uh, for now we are only left with the, with the theory. We will see perhaps in the future whether we have some empirics. So that was just about the uh, one of the points that we raised and uh, of course thank you very much for all your comments very helpful i also took quite a bit of notes so thank you great thanks casimiro you know it's fascinating and i'm very struck at, at the point you made sort of uh, as you uh, towards your introduction to, to base when you went to base when you mentioned you know just the change in credit conditions and what is that going to expose as to behavior i mean i think there is such we're, we're, we're really at an inflection point in terms of all of this so it will be fascinating to see how law functions and and, and, and whether or, or, or if behavior will change um so look that's a fantastic discussion frank unless you want to come back in i think i'll move us on to the next panel if there's any other comments people wanted to make um just want to check you're are you okay frank uh please do yeah, great. Um, Tobias, thank you. Look, I mean, I think loads of food for thought for everybody here. And I'm just very struck at how the enduring importance of this debate about um, default rules and how they how they impact on these, you know, hugely important kind of funding decisions and structures. And you see this, this these parallel worlds of sort of regulation that's trying to be transformative. And yet we have this you know, exceedingly sort of complex and subtle world in terms of how these default rules for, for corporates are, are operating. I have no view on the debate about the sophistication of Italian courts that's going on in the chat. I will leave that to, to other colleagues. Um, right. So now, we're going to move into the final session today and really uh...